Okay, we're being recorded. So hopefully you found the lab. I've had some questions about the lab. Again, I'll stick around after class if people want to answer those um, <coughs> to talk about it. Um, I know there's some feedback on the video, but you know, it kind of is what it is. Um, I was still able to get the instructions. It was annoying, but I was able to get them. Watch as many times as you want, but I can go over some of it. Um, after class, I can share the application on the web, and I can show you a little bit of it. Uh, please keep in mind that the large measurement portion is extra credit. So, um, so the part that would be like lab, actually, that, that takes a lot and a lot of analysis. Uh, I'm not going to provide you with the analysis files, which makes it rather difficult, but it's extra credit. So extra credit's extra credit. It's meant to be overly difficult. But if you have some spare time and want to try and make the map uh, and do some interpolation, interpolation uh, you know, have at it. Um, so, <coughs> so anyway, let's get started with Gauss's Law and review. Because uh, we're going to wrap up Gauss's Law pretty quickly today, I think within a half an hour, and then we'll move on to electric potential. Um, if I talk too loud and the microphone feedback happens, someone will just let me know or raise ha the hand or something or, or open your mic and say something. Uh, I'm trying to work on it, but as all things, as you've seen, it's all sort of a <laughs> learning in process. So when we look at Gauss's Law, our grand equation here. This, like I said before, is one of our main equations of the semester. Okay? And you'll notice it's, it can look a little intimidating, but <coughs> it relates the electric field here to the enclosed charge. And I don't know if we did this previously, but I wanted to show you, look at one of these point charges. Okay, and, and I want to do this example. If we did it before, that's fine, but I want, I want you to see how Gauss's Law works. Um, right, I'm, I'm looking at something else there at the end of the chapter. I do want to sort of, I want you to see a little bit again how Gauss's Law works and can actually recover Coulomb's Law. So if we, did it, if we did it before, it's fine, we can do it again. So for a point charge, just take a look at a single point charge, one of the two next to you, it doesn't matter which one. And you can draw, uh, you want to draw the most symmetric surface around um, the point charge, which would be a sphere. So the integral of E dot dA becomes epsilon naught E times the surface area of a, of a sphere, which you draw around, around one of those point charges, which if you don't know is 4 pi <coughs> r squared. All right, and that's going to be e equal to q and closed. Now, if you solve for e here, or for the electric field, I'll draw it down here, you get the e equals uh, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over r squared. And you'll notice, you'll notice that, just, that just recovers what we had in the last chapter, in chapter 22, <coughs> for a point charge. So we can see that Gauss's Law is a more general statement of Coulomb's Law because it gives us everything we need back. Now you'll remember that k, I'll write it up here, k, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which means that this will be equal to, down here at the bottom, k q over r squared. It's a little tilted, but that's OK. We do the best we can. All right, so that is <coughs> the basics of Gauss's Law. We saw Gauss's Law for several things, again, you can look at your recording. We've gone over this stuff. Uh, we talked about Gauss's law in sheets, uh, in conducting sheets. Uh, we talked about the line charge. We saw how easy that was. And we stopped here looking at this um, two conducting plates. <coughs> okay? Uh, Gauss's law between these conducting plates. And we, um, we derived this expression 
we derived the expression here that we found, the sigma over epsilon naught. Um, a lot of our <laughs> a lot of our derivation comes from understanding physically to what happens to charges in a conductor. And I want to review that briefly. In a conductor, the charges are on the surface. And that's what you see here with these two um, with these two charges. Or these two walls. Hold on. With these two walls. Okay? Now, charges also move. So as you start putting these closer together, the charges on this side are going to migrate all the way over here, inducing the negative charges to move all the way over here. They're going to be attracted to each other. And this means that there will be no charge on the other side of the wall. That's what leads to this zero E-field region, <laughs> okay, on both sides. And when you get the total electric field, or you double the charge density, so you get this uh, electric field, constant electric field, that's equal to sigma over epsilon naught. Okay, but again, charges can, are on the surface and charges migrate. Those are the two ideas to understand charge flow in a conductor. All right, so the last thing I want to cover with Gauss's law is we want to look at Gauss's law both inside and outside a uh, charge distribution. Okay, so even though most conductors, the charge is on the surface, <laughs> We want to consider a volume charge or a solid sphere or a, something, a shell where you can't uh, put it as one point, right? We can't approximate it as one point. So you could, be, you could be down here or in here, but you might be at some point in, in this shell. Say this whole shell is charged. <laughs> so and we want to look at our equation. And I want you to take a look at this part. And you'll notice this new criterion here that this is for R, the radius, greater than the R of the shell. So where R is somewhere out here, and this is an, a Gaussian surface outside the charge. You'll notice, uh, uh, what I really want you to see is um, take a look at what happens when you, as R goes to zero of this equation. So here, uh, as <coughs> r goes to zero, right, e will go to infinity. So if this were really true, if this were physically true, right, then this would be an easy way to get free energy. You could just make everything smaller and jam it together. You'd get more energy, and the world would not have energy crisis. But that's not how things go. <laughs> right? So let's take a look at let's look at that and let's see what happens for um, uh, for a solid. So here here I think what we're looking at applying Gauss's law to a surface in which R is equal to R, they're saying that if you're inside away from the charge density, E is equal to zero. That is true. But we want to I thought I was on the next slide. But <laughs> if you have a solid distribution or something like that something like this, then it becomes a different problem, right? <laughs> now, when you have a conductor, you might have an ionized gas, and that's where you need to use Gauss's law for something like this. And they just state here the result, which is never fun. We want to try and derive it, at least give it a chance. So let's take a look at, at the total charge we have. So how you do this is outside, Right? If you have an enclose, if you're enclosing all the of the charge of say a gas, then you have uh, the same relation we had before. Right? We have uh, I'm going to choose a different color so it's visible. Choose red, so we can see that E will equal be equal to uh, K Q over R squared if we're outside. But again, I just, as I just pointed out, what I just wrote down here. This goes to infinity if we start to go in. And that doesn't make sense because we're encircling less charge. <clears throat> so the way to derive this on the inside is to ask yourself, well, what does Q enclosed look at, look for? Well, if you look here, the total Q enclosed is equal to... Um, the volume charge um, 
or is equal to the charge. Well, basically, we can look at this as a fraction of the charge versus the um, <coughs> versus the uh, what you call it, the full four thirds pi r. No, yeah, four thirds. Hold on, I'm messing something up. Uh, let's delete this. That's the worst pi I think I've ever drawn. So four thirds pi r cubed. Basically, it's the volume of a sphere. But what we can say is that that total charge per volume will equal any enclosed volume over. Four thirds pi little r cubed. And this is where stuff gets interesting, okay? Because when you're looking for q enclosed, <coughs> you can you can scratch off these, because these are the same, and you can get that your q total over r cubed, big R cubed is equal to Q enclosed over little r cubed. Now let's keep in mind of a few things. One, <coughs> the first thing is that you have a little r here is, arbit is some arbitrary distance that's enclosed. And here you have r is your main <coughs> fixed r. So these are all constant. And these are variable. And if we apply Gauss's law, let's do that really quickly. Uh, one thing I don't like about the slide sort of done this way is that <coughs> they don't just always start with Gauss's law, which is always a good idea. So we'll start with it here where we can write it epsilon naught integral of E dot D A right, equals Q enclosed. Now we already saw what this looks like. We just did it in the previous slide. So for the integral. So we're going to have this. This is going to imply we want to replace each part that epsilon naught. The integral of E dot dA is going to be E. And this is, by the way, we're looking at R less than R. All right. So we have this times uh, 4 pi r squared, all right? And that's going to equal q enclosed, which if you solve for q enclosed, right? q enclosed equals q <coughs> times r cubed over r, big R cubed. Okay? And we want to and we want to write that here. Otherwise we're just memorizing stuff. We don't see how to get it. I don't like memorizing things. So this becomes pretty interesting, right? In particular, the R squared goes away here and we're left with one R. If you solve for the electric field, you get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over r cubed times r, right? Where big R is fixed, so keep that in mind. Big R is the fixed radius. It never changes. And then as we shrink and get a smaller and smaller and smaller fraction, uh, you'll notice that, <coughs> that the little r is the variable r. But I want you to look at both the equation we derived and the uh, equation given here for the electric field. Note some things. One, they're identical. And two, as r goes to zero,
right? E goes to zero. <coughs> Just as we expect. <clears throat> One of the hardest things to convince yourself about <coughs> Gauss's law is that if there is no charge, there is no electric field. There are a lot of times where zero actually is the correct answer. So, you know, we want to keep that in mind. Okay. Questions? Thoughts? On Gauss's Law? That's pretty much it for Gauss's Law. We did a lot of stuff with it yesterday and saw how to manipulate it. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, switch gears to um, potential, which is can be very confusing. There's a lot to unpack there. We have gone, basically we've gone through a few Caesar. Um, this is, it's basically plugging number, like given numbers in here. Um, I'd encourage you to look at the one star problems in the book. Uh, we did some examples yesterday with this. Um, so in fact, I would call your attention before we move on. Uh, we just really reviewed and wanted to finish up Gauss's law today. Uh, I would recall that we recall you to deriving using Gauss's law, which again is the important part here, using Gauss's law to derive these uh, equations, <coughs> such as this one. Um, I believe we did uh, we did the we derived the linear charge density. Um, all of this is just like the the examples with numbers would wouldn't be much different from Coulomb's law. So I think we went over enough stuff to uh, see how to do it. So I'm gonna have you. Um, I'm gonna have you guys look over all of that uh, again. Using Gauss's law to derive the electric field is the important part. So picking your Gaussian surface and integrating—that's uh, the key part. Okay. So <coughs> let's go to <coughs> the next. The next chapter. And by the way, I think this chapter here would be the last chapter for exam one. I'm not comfortable asking for more than this for exam one. So everything we've done to now, plus this chapter, that's it. It's uh, adding anything else would be too much. Uh, and this is already kind of pushing it, but. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember which classes I'm talking to. So if I didn't say it on Tuesday, I'll say it now. So the, your exam will just be right when we come back from spring break. As far as I've been told today, spring break will be as scheduled. That being said, things change daily, so I can't, you know, I can't guarantee that um, things just change very, very quickly. But that being said. That's how we're going to do it. Um, let me see here. Share now. Um, so, okay. No, that's the wrong slide. So, electric potential. Now, electric potential will introduce us to a quantity that you're all familiar with called, um, oh, right, right, uh, called voltage. All right, so the symbol for electric potential will be a big V, not velocity, and the unit will be <coughs> volts. So you all should be familiar with <laughs> things like volts um, in the sense in the sense really that you know batteries, a lot of electrical equipment, the voltage is important, uh, and we'll be learning about those basics. So uh, this this will also serve to bridge between these abstract idea of fields to give us what I like to think of as the interlude of circuits, which is a bit a bit simpler. Um, but it'll give us the machinery to talk about them. So let's let us go. All right. So of all that. So the electric potential at some point P in the electric field of the charge is given here in terms of the charge, the work, and the potential energy. Okay, and you'll notice there's this weird work infinity uh, symbol. So the work infinity symbol, this guy here, is the work that would be done by the electric force on a positive test charge where it brought 
this test charge in from an infinite distance to the point P. So if we can look here, it's you have to imagine that the uh, clicker is off the screen and then comes in from infinity and brings the charge and lets it rest here. Okay? <coughs> and U is the electric potential energy that would then be stored in the test charge object system. So basically, we have an object and our test charge and the energy. No, bad. The energy is described as the energy of this system. This is what U describes. Okay? U. Okay? And, um, <coughs> and if a particle with charge Q is placed uh, somewhere, um, is, is placed where the electric potential is, if you put a point here instead of the charge, right, the electric potential energy of the particle object system is going to be equal to U equals QV. All right? Now, we're going to be talking about energy again in this chapter, which I think you can see, but understanding how this, what this stuff is and how it works is important. So usually we'll talk about the potential at a point, much like the electric field, all right? And we'll talk about the potential energy of the system as having a, this test charge and bringing it in to infinity and talking about the energy of the system. Sort of like a, an equivalent way of looking at this is um, a force, the electric force is how is equal to a test charge times the electric field, right? But we can look at the electric field at some point away from the charge distribution. And we can look here at the, um, ele the uh, potential energy of the system. So the force would be like the potential energy. And we could look at that in terms of the system. And the potential is a bit more like the electric field where we can look at a point off from a charge distribution. Keep in mind that this U, right, is Q times uh, uh, Q times V, where you have Q here, and then you're, uh, you'll have a charge distribu distribution associated with the uh, potential. OK. <coughs> so if that's confusing, that's good. We'll be unpacking that confusion for the rest of the evening. Now, we want to go over these sets of equations, because we're going to set up our definition, our ability to solve for the potential difference um, versus uh, the electric field. All right. So first of all, if the particle, if a particle moves through a potential difference delta v, the change in electric potential energy is given here. So let's take a look at each of these parts of this. Let's break this equation down. So basically, what it's saying is, if you have a potential difference between two points, right? Say this is 10 volts and zero volts and a charge moves from higher potential to lower potential, right? So say there's a charge that, that moves along there. The change in potential energy is given by that charge times the potential difference. OK? And we'll have to go back to chapter 6 to look at some of this stuff. We know that the work from our work energy theorem, we have work equals <coughs> work equals delta K equals minus delta U. And if you remember, we can see here that basically a gain, this says that when you lose potential energy, you gain kinetic energy and vice versa. If they had the same symbols, you'd gain both types of energy. We just really can't do that. So that's where all the negative comes from here. And again, delta U, you're just replacing it with Q minus delta V. And we have our equation for work and um, from conservation of mechanical energy. A, um, we have our, um, our equation here that we, we had a, we had a, oh, that we have up here that I'm, I'm oh, hey, bad. The written equation here. And we can see here that if we have the work done by an applied force, if there's an applied force moving that charged particle, we can account for the work. 
All right, so a lot of this is your basic chapter seven, eight stuff from last semester. Um, but this definition will also help us connect the electric field to the, um, <coughs> will help us connect the electric field to the potential. And in order to do this, we want to introduce this idea of equipotential surface. All right, so if you look at each of these surfaces next to us, Okay, there's no work done going from one point to another along the surface because the potential is the same. So in an equipotential surface, these would all could have all like voltages. So let's look at here. Let's make it explicit. I'm just making some stuff up here. We could call this 0, 5, 10, 15. All right, and you'll notice that the work delta work is equal to minus Q delta V. If you stay on this surface, delta V is zero, so no work's done. And you can move around the surface freely, it doesn't cost energy. But to go from one surface to the other surface to go through a potential difference, that will take work. All right? And again, equal work, the path, this is a, we're going to find that the electric force is a conservative force. So that means that it doesn't matter whether you go down or all the way down and all the way back up. The same amount of work is done to get from V1 to V2, the same potential difference. All right. Similarly here, even though you're moving, whatever you, difference you get, you lose. If you end up on the same surface, no work is done. All right. So that, that um, idea of conservative force, forces and path independence will be important. Okay, now, equipotential surfaces with real fields, I think, is important to see. So you'll notice that with a constant electric field, right, that's in the blue, you have these equipotential lines that are evenly uh, surfaced out of the way. So a lot of times you'll find things go from higher potential, 100 volts, to 0 volts, from higher to lower. So you could break these into even increments <coughs> and label them if you wanted. Now, with point charge distributions, well, this can be a little interesting. So you have this, you'll notice with a, a um, you'll notice with a, uh, <coughs> a uh, point here, with these point charge, with a point charge, you have these circular equipotentials, all right? And uh, with the dipole, you get these equipotential surfaces. Now, you'll notice that the field is always perpendicular to the equipotential surface. So if you draw these surfaces, you can actually map the field. And that's what I asked you to do in lab. And going out on a whim, hold on. Going out on just a little bit of a whim, we're gonna try something here. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it might work. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Hold on. Um, Hold on, we need the, uh, let me see if I can share an application screen. Um, select a window. Um, <coughs> videos, where's Firefox? There we go. Hold on. <coughs> let me see if this works. Nope, that's the indicator. That's not what I want. Let me see if I can. Uh, let me see if I can open another window. Hold on. There we go. Um, hold on. Allow. Hold on. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Let's see if we can do this one. Nope, that's not what I really wanted to do, but that's okay. Um. 
Hold on. Hold on. Da, 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 da. Okay, the sharing the application is. All right, let me see here. Um, uh, you know what? Inbox, Logitech, Electric Field, Hockey, Skype. Let's let's see if I can go to the FET site. Okay, this is taking too long. I think I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint slide. But if you go into the lab uh, with the electric fields, uh, you can make these equipotential surfaces. If you watch the video, I asked you to do that. And <coughs> you can play around with these things. And if you make the uh, if you make the uh, the measurement um, if you make a bunch of measurements you can actually create your own equipotential surfaces by finding the points where the potentials are all the same the potential differences are all the same so let's get back to let's get back to our part here though okay That worked better. I couldn't find the window. Um, uh, I couldn't find the window for the uh, screen sharing, and I don't want to do the whole screen. That could, I had a lot of stuff open. Um, <coughs> so, but you would find that you could make these equipotential surfaces, and then there's a voltmeter in that particular simulation. And if you move that um, around, you'll find uh, you'll get the same uh, volts. Note, it's the electric, it's the voltage, not the electric field. The electric field, you'll notice, is very different values along the equipotential surface. It's just always perpendicular to it. Okay? All right. So, <coughs> now we want to look at and sort of understand where we're coming from here. Okay? So, in order to, they sort of just dump this equation on you, but it's not terribly difficult to derive. So let's go back for a second and see if we can derive it from here. <coughs> All right. So if we if we look here, remember that we have here this equation. This is the work done by a force as it moves from uh, an initial point to a final point. This equation is pretty easy to see. Again, we can get here from our definition of work with, with the opposite, um, with our work energy theorem, our conservation of energy. We can get this minus sign and see where it comes from. Now, let's go forward. <coughs> so work, if you remember fundamentally, is equal to the line integral of the force dot um, uh, ds along a path, right? Initial to final. So if we recall here that the force is equal to q times e, well, the work becomes the integral of q times e uh, times the path, right, dot ds. And we can see that on the other side of the equation, we have minus q delta v. These q's cancel. And you can see quite clearly that just from using the definition of work and our force here, qe, 
<coughs> equation, our simplified force equation, we get very in a very straightforward manner that the potential difference is equal to negative the integral of E dot ds from the initial to the final point. All right, you're going to notice when we go forward, I'll let you look at that for a second or two. Uh, as we go forward, that is our equation. So even though it looks like it's just dumped, <coughs> um, dumped like magic, right, it really just comes from everything we've looked at before, okay? <coughs> and if we have just a path, a linear path, or if, we, uh, or if we have a uniform magnitude, that delta S just becomes the path, and we get this nice, simple uh, a, uh, expression for delta V related to E. However, that won't always be the case, right? And you can look that sometimes we'll have these interesting paths that will depend on how many field lines we cross, right, as we go through. So uh, if we choose arbitrarily, V initial, um, if VI equals zero, right, you can set this equal to zero and just call uh, VFV, and that's where you get this equation from. So that's just a simplified way of saying it. And then you get, um, you know, if, you, if you're uh, in a uniform magnetic field, then you're just going along the path to displacement. Okay? So... That's the easiest, the easiest definition of doing this. Getting the potential from the electric field is a pain in the butt. There's no kind of easy way to do it. Well, let me see. I think feel like we skipped something. No, that's fine. Okay. So <coughs> let's take a look here at some stuff. <coughs> so if we look for a simple charged particle. Right? We know we can start with our main equation here. And we can uh, look for a radial path. You'll notice we have our, our picture over here. Right? And you want to see where we look at. The, they're subtle, but there are replacements from our general equation to our specific equation. So first of all, if we have a point charge, this is the field. Uh, if we want to find the, the voltage, that would be the voltage that the test charge feel. Or, or yeah, no, we want we can uh, we can find the potential energy uh, that the test charge feels, but then we can find the voltage here that it would it would have. So to find the potential of a charged particle, we'll move this test charge here out to infinity. All right, that will give us the voltage here. <clears throat> in order to do that, we start here at the initial point, point, which we'll call R. That's the distance from the charge and move it out to infinity. Now, this is kind of weird looking. If you remember, and I want to go all the way back to our first slide. Remember, we have a potential energy here. Right when we have our test charge and our charge distribution. The potential here is given by taking this test charge and moving it way out to infinity. And that will give us the electric potential at this point. It's worth saying again. And that's exactly what we're doing with our, with our point charge. We have a point charge. And so to ask what the potential is means what is the potential to get some other point charge at some distance from this uh, fixed charge. And what is the potential, if we, if we start at that distance, what's the potential by moving it from that initial position, which we'll call R, all right, all the way out to infinity, okay? So when we do that, we, have, we, we now have sort of the geometry of the integral set up. Uh, the magnitude of the electric field from Coulomb's law is given right here, right? So now we just get this E, stick it in the integral right there, and then we have 
are integrand, right? We just we you know have a <coughs> we can evaluate the integral, and that's pretty you know that's that's this one here. That's not a hard integral to evaluate. But what am I doing at the other side? So at infinity, generally, v is equal to zero. That's one of those things we have, and that makes sense, right? There should be no effect from infinity, period. So um, there should be zero potential potential at infinity. And then we'll set v initial equal to the full voltage at uh, the point we're at, right? Whatever value it is, here it is. Uh, at this point, and then as we go away, that test charge should matter less and less and less, and that's why the potential at infinity is zero. <laughs> now, this is a calc one integral. I'm going to delete this part here, this one circle. So we have, we understand why we have zero here, but remember, it's still final minus initial. So we have zero at the final, minus v, and that's going to be equal to minus Q, the Q will come out, right, over 4 pi epsilon naught. And now we just do this nice calc 1 integral, just like you would in calc. And you evaluate it infinity and R, right? So when you do that, you'll get 1 over infinity minus 1 over R. And uh, they've gotten rid of, no, that's fine. So um, <coughs> so here we'll have we'll evaluate this as one over the top one, right, which is infinity minus um, the bottom one, one over R. <coughs> And when we do all that, I feel like this becomes zero. Yep. Uh, is this a minus minus somewhere? This always happens where I, I <laughs> my favorite part about this chapter is I get stuck with a, I always lose a minus sign somewhere. So we kept our minus sign here. We have a minus sign here. Those two go away. That's where we get there, but ah, they have not they have not done something cool. They missed a minus sign from the integration. So this will be minus plus because remember this is the integral, I think how I would have written this is r to the negative two. Right? So you still have a minus when you do the uh, power rule. And that's where the minus comes from. So <laughs> yeah, there's just a typo here. That's fine. <laughs> they forgot to uh be consistent. That's okay. If you're wondering, just do do the integral this way. You'll see that there's a minus. The integral of one over r squared is not one over r. It's minus one over r, and then that's where the minuses go away, and you get this correct equation in the box. No, I crossed out. Let me, let me uh, delete that. <coughs> Right, you get this here. And that is your potential for a point charge. Okay, it's always kind of, this is about as simple as it gets, and it always kind of gets a little ugly. So, <coughs> so, are there any questions there? This sort of blurbed a lot. I notice I've got 20 out of you, and no one's and no one's complained. Yeah, and go back through and let it marinate for a little bit. The calculus should be straightforward. I hope you all see where the the slight error is um, in the slide, which we corrected here by by noticing um, that you're going to get another minus sign from integrating here that they've left off. Um, or they didn't leave it off and they just left this sign here, which is what they might have done, so that they do get minus here when they do the integral, and then the, this minus cancels here. I guess there's a lot of ways to see where the minus cancels. 
But either way you look at it, it's it's all going to come off okay. <clears throat> that is that is one way, I suppose, to interpret it, is that they, they took their minus, canceled it, and now they just have done math. They could have been a little more explicit about that. And then if you do it that way, and then if you do it that way, uh, let me clear everything. If you do it that way, then you do have minus... Um, Uh, minus 1 over R here, right, from the evaluation of the integral, and then the minus B, and that's, they canceled this minus with integration, and then this minus goes away with that minus and get the D. So yeah, that's a way, that is a way to interpret it. But uh, unfortunately, I guess math isn't as clean cut as one would hope all the time. Because in my head, I canceled the minuses here, and that's where I got tripped up. So, all right, so I guess that, that's okay. But still, questions? Again, as Daniel points out, that was a lot. So take a look at it. Let it marinate with a while, for a while. Uh, to look at the big picture, essentially, conservation of energy will allow us to define um, voltage, and we can look at the energy of a test charge with a point distribution or we can kick that test charge to infinity and get the potential difference at some point, right? And then we used energy conservation to derive this equation here. Um, <coughs> yeah, if you can, you need to rewatch it. It's too, way too much to go over completely. Uh, that's, I'm trying to do that now, Lewis. So again, uh, we started out, um, I'll go back to the slides even. Uh, again, to sort of where we are is we were able to talk about the difference between the potential energy of a charge distribution and the potential of a uh, uh, and the potential of that charge distribution at a point. All right, and you use the uh, test charge will exist that you look at will be the, the energy it takes to bring this charge in from infinity to this point, and that will give you the potential energy of this whole system. The electric potential at this point can be calculated by, uh, you know, once you have that potential energy, if you will, kicking that point back out to infinity, all right? So V will be equal to that potential energy divided by that test charge. That's what will we'll kick it out. Um, this is easier to see when we do it with the electric field and the integral. But you'll notice, again, we have a system with a point charge, and then we sort of kick that point charge back out, much like we evaluate the field. We don't need a charge at a location to have an electric field value. <coughs> due to a charge distribution, we can have a potential due to a charge distribution at an arbitrary point. Now, once we do that, once we understand those definitions, then come the equations. Then come things like the work done by a field and conservation of energy. Um, once we apply that to our definition that we have of potential that we got from our uh, potential energy of a charge distribution, we have this nice set of equations. And if we use the definition of work, which I'll write here again, work is equal to the integral of a force dot ds, right? If we just recall that our force is equal to QE, it's these set of equations that um, from, the work energy, from the work energy theorem and conservation of energy that allow us to come to <laughs> um, this equation, right? And this is our general equation that allows us to relate the, uh, the um, potential difference to the electric field. And so when we look at this, when we first set up this problem, what are we going to be integrating? Well, we're going to be moving a point charge from zero, or not from zero, but from some point distance away from uh, our distribution. We're going to move that test charge to infinity. 
That's the path that we'll be integrating along. We'll be integrating along that field line. All right. And so first we define that field line geometrically. All right. So DS initial and final become well defined in terms of variables. Uh, we just plug in the electric field. Right. And that Q is not Q naught. It's the Q of the distribution. OK, because that's the field at the point. Right. Essentially. And then we just we recognize a few on the other side. We recognize that at infinity, the voltage will equal zero and the voltage will have its maximum value or the value we want to at that point. Right. It will be V. That will be the potential difference at the point. So we have this side of the equation. This side of the equation represents E plugged into uh, <coughs> plugged into this part here. So if you plug in E here, this this uh, electric field, that's where you get this integral from. All right, and when you take that integral, you get this term. This is a simple integral to take, and then equating, I'm going to change colors, setting everything equal on the red circled part and the blue circled part, you get your boxed equation with a potential difference of a point charge. Okay? So I, I, I'd say if you want to see it again, we can, uh, you, you'll have to go back and watch it. I'm glad we're recording. Um, <coughs> so let's see how, how gross this gets. Now, at first, we're just going to look at the electric field due to point charges. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do some examples. And uh, oh crap, I forgot to I forgot to delete the answers. Hold on, let me uh, let me cross out the answer here before you all see it. Well, probably read it. It's fine. <laughs> Let's at least understand it though. Uh, but we want to look at and understand that if we have um, uh, how to how to see the difference between an electric field and a potential for a given distribution of charges, all right? And that's what we're going to see. Now, if you have several point charges, you can simply add up everything you have and get uh, a, that the potential is the sum of all the potentials. So basically, what that means is, is if you have two charges and you're looking at this point here, you can find V1, V2, and V3 using the formula from the previous page, or from this one here, each one will have a term, and then you just sum them all together. <laughs> all right, V equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. All right, so let's look at this checkpoint here. The figure here shows three arrangements of two protons. Okay, so we want to write the arrangement according to the net electric potential at point P by the protons greatest first. Now, this is really actually kind of interesting. We're not looking at field, we're looking at the potential. And when you look at, when you look at things <coughs> term by term, right, you don't care about the other terms. You just deal with it one term at a time. So you don't, you don't like when you're looking at, at the proton here, you don't care about the one in the middle. And when you look at this, it's, it will actually become uh, very clear that they are all the same. So if you look at them, there's two terms to each, each equation here, right? You have V1 equals K Q proton over D, and V2 will equal K Q P over D. And you'll notice that no matter which way you have your orientation, you'll have both these terms, so when you add them, you'll get the same thing. Now I want you to notice, is potential a, a vector or a scalar? Checkpoint should give it away, but let's see. Oh, I'm just pouring myself some water. All right. It's a scalar. Very good. As you can 
see our arrangement didn't change the value. Now, what if I had asked you for the electric field at P? Well, that would have been different for each one, right? That could have been, that, that wouldn't necessarily have been the same because you have to look at the direction and take that into account too. <coughs> All right, so keep that in mind as we go forward. So now we want to do a example where we can have a little bit of fun, see some numbers, and get an idea of what's going on. All right, so it asks here in this question, what is the electric potential at point P located at the center of the square of these four charged particles? All right, well... <laughs> The first fun thing to do is to exploit some symmetry and figure out the distance. You'll notice we have the length of each side of the square, but the relevant distance is this one that I just drew, right? You'll notice that's the same for each one. So we want to draw a triangle. Right? You'll notice that the side here, due to it being a square, is d over 2. This side is d over 2. So the distance, I'll call it r, is equal to root 2 over 2 times d. Okay? And d, you'll notice, is given right there. So that's fun, that's cool. And we have each of the charges. <clears throat> so in order to solve this example, we'll note that the potential difference, right, is gonna just be, e gonna be equal to the sum of the, four of the four potentials. And you'll notice we have point charges for all of these. So we know that V equals K times Q over R. And so now this becomes pretty easy, right? Our total, our i, <laughs> vi for each of these, will be equal to that. So we can say that v is equal to v1 plus v2 plus v3 plus v4, right? And that's going to be equal to... Yeah, use your uh, triangle. Use your. Th this is this is math two hundred. Or the reason for that is math two hundred. That's uh, the Pythagorean theorem. If you don't believe me, you can <coughs> you can try it yourself. Basically, if you have a forty five forty five so uh, triangle, um, it's root two times the length. That's usually how it goes. Um, yeah. So, um, <coughs> so yeah. So we know that from the math, and this will be equal to K over R, because those are all the same, right? You'll notice there's no I's here, times Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4. All right, so that's all you have to do to get the total, the total voltage. Let's add up those charges, multiply it by K, and divide by R. And you will get, let me see. I have the handy dandy, uh, No, that is not handy nor dandy. Hold on. All right, so when you do that, you should get uh, about 350 volts. All right. So does everyone see how that one was done? Uh, the problem's not so terrible. Right, 
like, look at the triangle I have here to get this distance r. This leg is, uh, hold on. This leg is d over 2. This leg is d over 2. r squared is equal to d squared plus d squared or 2d squared. Square, you know, when you do this, this will be d over 4. d squared over 4 plus d squared over 4. I mean, you guys can see it, how it's going to happen. It's, it's, this is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. I'm going to, if you don't understand where this comes from, you will be much, it'll be much more beneficial for you to figure it out on your own than for me to go through it. Because then you'll just say, okay, and then you'll want to know next time. Because this is, this is, you saw this in Math 200, and it's just a Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, so you know, um, or basically, if you want, if you're still struggling with this, I'd rather go over it over office hours, which I'm more than happy to do, but after class or during office hours. Stuff like that. Okay, so, oh no, so I want you to look at these two, at this circularly distributed uh, bit of charge. <coughs> okay. So notice these are electrons, so they have a charge of minus E, right? They're equally spaced and fixed around a circle of radius R relative to V equals zero at infinity. That means that V equals zero way over here, and these are the voltages to bring them in. <laughs> now, what are the electric potential and electric field at the center of the circle? So we want to see, so we know So we know that V will be equal to K, that each individual one will be equal to V equals KQ over R squared, right? I, oh no, this will, uh, see, I messed it up. Let me clear. <coughs> that was wrong. VI equals K Q over R. And the electric field, we know the magnitude will be equal to K uh, Q over R squared. But we have to look at the direction, right? So we know that at this point P, all the field lines will have to go towards the electron, right? Because remember, field lines end. But you'll notice something. Notice that for every field line I draw, there's one going the opposite direction that lands on another charge. So without even without even um, figuring out what the values are, because we don't you know we don't need to, we can see that if you have for any red arrow you have an opposite one pulling the opposite direction, all the magnitudes of the charges are equal, so each pair will cancel out <coughs> and E will equal zero. Okay? Does anyone see that? Okay, good. Now, if we're just looking at potentials, there's no directionality involved, so I'm going to change my color here to orange. And here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 charges. So we know that Q, each QI is equal to minus E, right? And we know that the voltage will be equal to... 12, because there's 12 of them, times K, <coughs> K 
times uh, minus E. over R, right? So, and remember, E is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. All right. So, you'll notice we have, we do have a potential difference or a potential value. At the center, we do not have an electric field value, all right, because it cancels out. Now what we're going to do, and this is the interesting part of the problem, is not that part, but B. So now you'll notice the electrons are moved along the circle until they're in this arc. Now you'll notice it says, find the electric potential and describe the electric field. Well, the electric potential is still the same 12 dots. They're all still all away, and they're all still the same charges. So... V in A in B is equal to V in A. All right. So our what we found last time V equals minus twelve E times K over R. I just redid removed some stuff around, but it's the same thing. Uh, that still holds. However, E now, you'll notice that with E, it doesn't ask you to find it, it just wants you to describe, uh, describe the field. So you'll notice here with, um, let me uh, delete some of this stuff first. Yeah, do hate how I have to delete every little part. <laughs> I'm going to make some lines here. <coughs> but you'll notice that if I draw these, right, they're still symmetric. But you'll notice here, for instance, that each one has a corresponding one on the other side of it, and this one goes straight, well, straight-ish through the uh, center. And, right, so you can already see already that the electric field the uh, is set up so that the vertical components are going to cancel, and that there now is an electric field. I'm going to change colors to draw the net field, and that the net field will now point, oh no, I want to go to pencil. The net field will now point in the positive x direction, right? The horizontal points will all add, and the vertical parts will all cancel. <coughs> so that's how that will change. All right, are there any questions before we take a break? Does everyone see it? You mean the one with the circle? I won't have anything written on it. Oh, the E, oh, E is just 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. It's fundamental. If we go back, then we lose all the writing. So this is just the elementary charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. This one right here. <laughs> All right, uh, and here you'll notice that the field cancels, right, because they're all electrons. And ah, I messed that up. This is what happens when I've been doing this for four hours in a day. Remember, these are electrons, so the net field is actually going to go this way. <coughs> so... You can laugh it when you rewatch the lecture and be like, oh, Professor Tolan's going to realize he's wrong in a couple minutes, because I did. So remember, all the field lines end on the electrons. So the electric field, it'll still be along the x-axis, but it'll actually point in the negative direction. Okay? 
All right, it's 6.55, so let's go on break for 10 or 15 minutes. I'll keep the session recording, and uh, I'll, I might answer a few questions, but I'm going to pour some water and things like that. So... Uh, I'm I'm gonna be getting my honey cough drops. I was supposed to get them between classes, but I failed to do so. <sighs> oh, I like the dinosaur emoji. That's pretty awesome. All right, let's see here. So for the lab, uh, you have a video. Follow the video and uh, keep in mind, I'd write down the, I, I, I'd watch the instruction video several times if I were all of you, and write down uh, uh, questions and things that I ask, and then play with the simulations, and then uh, answer the questions. Uh, it's all verbal instructions at this point, and since you have them and you can keep going over them, you can just watch it. There's a few simulations, but please keep in mind that this lab will be covers two labs, so <coughs> there's quite a bit to watch and to read. So watch it carefully and think of it. Think of that as me talking in lab, and then you go and you kind of figure it out, because that's really what you should be doing in lab. So. Uh, so then, and you'll be using a long form lab report uh, because you'll be, with the, when it comes to simulations, you'll be doing your own procedure. I just asked you a set of questions, uh, and that should be good. Okay? Uh, let me see. <coughs> Hold on. I think uh, I'll have to look at that one after class as well. Uh, I'm, uh, if you, uh, I'm sure I got it. Um, let me check really quick. Hold on. Okay, yeah, you just sent them at five. So yeah, I, I was I was getting ready for class. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at it after class. <coughs> I've read your emails, Douglas, but I, uh, I thought I responded to you on Skype, so I thought that was enough. <coughs> I thought you... Turn on the light, it's getting dark. Well, I'm going to walk around for a minute because I need to, uh, my back's starting to hurt.
Okay, I'm back. Let's get the video going. Oh, allow. Share video. Here I am. Ooh, okay. <laughs> so, all right. <coughs> okay. Um, I guess we will move on. I guess meaning <coughs> that's uh, what we're going to do. <coughs> so, we want to now that we've looked at a point charge, you remember that we looked at the electric dipole after we looked at a point charge. And for the electric potential, we're going to want to pick an arbitrary point here, away from the two charges of the dipole. So now what you'll have to remember is that the dipole is sort of defined at its center. So that's where this distance r comes from. R plus and R minus are simply the respective distances from those um, from those particular uh, <coughs> charges. Now, keep in mind that we, when we're talking about the dipole, we often use the idea that R will be much, much greater than D, all right, where D is the distance between the charges. You can see it here, okay? And you'll notice we'll make a sort of a zoomed-in picture here. I want you to notice that R is far enough that it can look parallel here, but not, um, but not actually be parallel, meaning that they cross way over here eventually. These are small angles. So when we do this, this gives us yet another right triangle, which we love, right? And we can see here that we have um, R minus R, or R minus minus R plus. That's going to be the path length difference between those between these two paths. <laughs> okay, and we'll be able to <laughs> relate that to D. <coughs> we'll see this will become important when we try to uh, get a um, when we try to look for. Um, simplified versions of things. So let's come over here and look at our equation. You'll notice that V for the dipole, the voltage, again, there's two charges in the dipole, so we look at V plus and V minus, which we've indicated here. And you have Q plus minus Q over R plus, and then R minus for the minus Q, all right? So when you do the fraction <coughs> and you get everything done, you have this nice constant term, q over 4 pi epsilon naught, but then you have this business to do, to deal with. And the r plus, <coughs> um, r minus is not very nice, and again, we prefer to look at the dipole as a single object. So in order to do that, we'll want to get things in terms of r, and preferably the dipole moment, so we want, so remember p, equals QD. So particularly we want things in terms of R and D and Q if possible. We already have things in terms of Q, so that's okay. Um, but <coughs> we're going to look at this angle theta here. Now you'll notice if you use the triangle, you can see here that uh, that D cosine theta, or rather let me, let me delete that. <coughs> that is not obvious. Let's do this the other way. We can see here that cosine theta, right, will equal the adjacent, which is R minus right, over the hypotenuse, which is D. Now, for all my math lovers out there, <coughs> you'll notice here 
it says that this is approximately true and not equal. And that's because these aren't parallel. This isn't an approximate right triangle, right? Here it looks parallel, but we can prove that it's not just by looking at the fact that they converge up here. All we're saying is that we're far enough away that this is approximately parallel. And if it's approximately parallel, this is approximately a right triangle. And if it's approximately a right triangle, then we can't maintain an equality here. We just have an approximation. However, the nice thing is that if, v, if this is huge and very big, that means that r plus and r minus, the difference between them, is fairly small. It's only this little tiny bit here. So we can look at the denominator and say that r minus times r plus is approximately r squared. All right? And using these two approximations, they make our lives a little easier. And you'll notice we now have q, right? We do have this theta angle, but that's okay. We have r, so that's a good dipole quantity, and we have d. And if you remember, qd, as we said, equals p, and we can get the voltage or potential difference of a dipole, or electric dipole. It may, it's, it's funny, if you just look at it without thinking too much about it, or you just spit out the formula, rather, it just, it, it looks like, like, where did this come from? But what I really want to emphasize is that it comes from the definition we just used, right, from the point charges. We can use the dipole of point charges to get a resultant expression, and that's just what we have right there. Okay? Questions? <coughs> Thoughts? <coughs> okay. So, you're going to notice that much like we did for a, <coughs> much like we did for um, uh, electric fields, uh, we're going to now move to charge distributions. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this, because this can get rather obnoxious very quickly. Um, so for a continuous charge distribution, the potential is found by dividing the distribution into little elements dq that can be treated as particles and then summing up the potential due to each one by integrating over the full distribution. So let's take a little look at that. So remember, we have v <coughs> is equal to... Um, um, what you call it? V is equal to the sum of K Q over R. Now, if we have a continuous distribution like a line or a disk or anything, remember what we did with the electric field. We took a little chunk of it dV so that was easy to deal with, and we would find that K dq over r. And now when you add them up, you make each dq as you make these smaller. To add them up, you would have that v equals the integral of dv equals um, k times the integral of dq over r. But I want to show you how complicated physics 2 can get very quickly. All right? If you remember, V is also equal to minus of E dot DS. So if you really want to have some fun and drive yourself crazy, it is possible to get problems that would require you to write this wondrous equation down. Minus E dot DS is equal to K times the integral of DQ over R. And now I hope you see why we need that calc prerequisite. <laughs> um, <coughs> No, 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 I'm going to delete K. 
You may have a setup where you have something like this, and this can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, usually you'll be able to handle it, but you know, it's just, it's, it can get a lot of, the calculus can get heavy very quickly. Um, particularly if some of these are, <laughs> you know, double and triple integrals, things like that. Uh, with the DQ, if you have like a volume charge density, all that good stuff. So, fun times, right? Um, but we're going to look at two continuous distributions to at least see how this works for the line and the disk. <coughs> okay? And then it can be even more fun if you need to use gases a lot to get E first, plug it in here, and then get the charge distribution. Uh, it's all sorts of fun stuff you can do. <coughs> so, let's look at our specific examples before we go too crazy. All right. So I want to go over a line. We have this nice little line charged. Um, so the charge rod here, as the, the gray box says, is not a particle. But you'll notice we break it into a little tiny bit. So in essence, we look at a line charge as a bunch of particles put together right next to each other. And so we just take some arbitrary little tiny amount, ds. That's what's going on here, right? And we can make a distance r from that point here to the point of interest. And then d is this distance that's right angle distance. All right? <coughs> so our job is to add all the little potential bits due to all of the elements, right, from 0, where d is equal to r, all the way out here to r, where x is equal to l. Okay, so looking back, <coughs> if you remember for an electric field, when we had dq, we had it that dq is equal to the linear charge density times dx. Okay, <coughs> so we can look at our dv equals what uh, equals k dq over r, we can look at this as um, k lambda dx. Now, recall x is not equal to r, right? So if you look here, if this is x and this is r, we want to, we have an, a dx, right? You can see that here. We have a dx. So we don't have a dr, so it would be more advantageous to represent r in terms of a fixed distance, such as d, and the variable s, and we can do that, right? Use your Pythagorean theorem, and you get x squared plus d squared is equal to r squared, so r is equal to x squared plus d squared to the one-half power. <coughs> and you'll notice just by looking and analyzing these things, the equation comes quite straightforwardly. All right, you're just plugging stuff in, and you're doing your you're analyzing the triangle for each individual component. Now, <coughs> all you have to do is integrate from x. You have your limit, right? X equals zero is where you start. X equals l, whatever the length of the rod is, is where you end, and you evaluate the integral. Now, this is your nice calc two integral, and I would definitely look this one up in a table. All right. Just look it up in the table. Don't kill yourself doing it. And you'll notice that you get a fairly complicated function for v. Okay? Um, but <coughs> the scary part is not that it's the natural log of, of this stuff here. All right? What's important to see is the procedure. You start here with dv equals k dq over r. First, you make dq into something more manageable. dq was equal to lambda, the ch constant charge density, times dx in the small part here. All right, so that's how we handle dq. And then r will just be that arbitrary distance from wherever we are. 
And when you want to put r, make sure that r makes sense in terms of a variable that we're going to integrate with respect to, such as dx, and something constant. So we want to make r simpler. Even though r is just one thing, it is actually simpler here because we don't have a dr here. And we know that r depends on x, but now instead of having it um, implicit, it's explicit. And so using the Pythagorean theorem, we get this x squared plus d squared, but again, it's r, not r squared, so you have to be sure you take the square root there. And now you have your dv. And now the next step is to integrate all along the rod, from the beginning of the rod at x equals 0 to the end of the rod at x equals L. And then you have this very nice calc 2 or calc 3 problem, but since this is not calc 2 or calc 3, you use the table, poof, and you get your integral. Okay? Questions about the line of charge <laughs> and what we're looking at. Okay, good. All right, I'll give it a, a couple more seconds to see if someone types, types something in. And while I give it a second, I'm going to take the attendance, which is very simple because all I have to do is put... Um, all I have to do is, I don't know who that is, um, take my camera, go up to the screen, push the button, we're done. All right. <laughs> Fastest attendance ever, right? Um, <coughs> so, okay. All right, so now we're going to go to a disk. Okay? And it's the same, what I want you to recognize is that it's the same basic procedure. So I want to start with the same equation again, which is dv equals k dq over r. So the first step is still the same to define dq, right? dq. <coughs> um, is going to equal sigma times da and da is this little part is going to be the circumference <coughs> times this little dr that's how we do that Okay, so it's just, uh, if you look at the thing here, it's just this little tiny ring of the disk, this uh, subsection of disk, and then its width is dr. It's very, it's very thin. So we do that because that will, you know, as we go from 0 to r, that will help us integrate along there. So we've, we've, we're able to get our dq, so that's the first step. Now we have to look at r, so we want to point above the disk. We want r in terms of stuff we're going to actually integrate with respect to, right? So we're going to integrate with respect to this r point here. So that's going to be fixed to not, we're not integrating here. That may be seem tempting. We're actually going to integrate from zero out to the end of the disk. So we want our, our, our variables, again, in terms of something that doesn't really change, which will be z here, squared, and then our integration variable. So you'll notice that's where, that's where you get this from. And I'd have you encourage you to use the Pythagorean theorem <coughs> to get that. It's not a big deal. Um, and again, you start out at 0, and you integrate all the way out to r. So it will be integrating from 0 to r. And so you'll notice you get dv. They wrote, they wrote this part down here, the dq over r. They plugged in dq, and they plugged in r. All right? Now, the next thing to do is to add up all little chunks. So you take out all the constants, and you integrate from 0 to r of this guy here, the r, r prime. Now, again, <coughs> you'll notice this is different than last time but you should go to your table of integrals 
and this will give you the value of the integral. All right, and then you can plug it from zero to R. And it should all make sense. So as ugly as it looks, the criteria is always the same. And that's the real, um, that's the real point there. <coughs> okay. When you go back and you review the video, you'll see that we did the same thing. The, 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 the steps were identical from the line charge to the charge disk. How they were executed was different because of the nature was different. But again, first we define DQ in terms of the shape. Let me go here again. DQ in ter terms of the shape. Then we find R in terms of that, and that will get DQ will generally give us our, integ our integration variable. Then we define our distance, our absolute distance from the point we're interested in to the point P, right? We'd absolutely define that distance in terms of something that doesn't change, that we're not going to integrate over, in ter in ter and in terms of the A variable directly, explicitly, that we're going to integrate over. All right? Once we do that, we now have our R. So you'll notice we're integrating over R prime here. We have R prime down there. There's another R prime here. <coughs> The next step is to figure out our limits of integration. So we want to sweep out the whole shape. So we start at zero, and then we increase the size of our little D, dr disk here to get to the full disk. So that's zero to r. We look up the integral in the table. We're done. We've got our voltage. OK? Um, that is a good question. Um, so generally, integrals is not something I, I, I'll give you two answers for this. <coughs> if I did, you could ask me what the integral is, I'd just give it to you. Um, the thing is, is I will not only integrate what's on the test, you know, I just will integrate things for you. So if you say, I need to integrate this, I'll integrate it. That doesn't mean it's useful or viable for the exam. I won't go, oh no, you don't need to integrate that. That being said, um, you will be doing your test on the internet, and I don't have the lockdown browser functions. So if I were you, I would get your calculus book or print, if you can, a uh, table of integrals uh, that you have available to you. I don't think I should be asking you to do anything that hard, uh, but the, the questions may require some brief integration. Uh, again, the tests are going to be multiple choice, so that should help you pick out some things uh, and do some things, and I'm not thrilled about that, but um, that's the uh, that's the way that cookie I think has to crumble. Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, keep that in mind. I'm still working out all the uh, bells and whistles for the exam, <clears throat> but you should be comfortable integrating, y'all. At the very least, using a, a, a table of integrals. Uh, and integrating is, is critical. So you're going to want to remember that. <laughs> OK. So let's go forward a little bit and talk about calculating the field from the potential. Now, it shouldn't surprise you that if you have the potential, so we've, we've already done you know, if you have, hold on, given E, right, we already know that V equals the integral, the line integral of E dot dS. Of course, I'm off by a minus. That's fine. But it shouldn't surprise you then that if you have that given V, finding E, requires you take a derivative. All right? So, and what you find here is that negative sign is still preserved. <coughs> and let's see, they're trying, to, they're trying to make it all fancy here. Um, <coughs> let's see. If you have, um, let's 
let's see here. If we have dv equals um, equals k q over r, like that gq. <laughs> um, Let's see here. Hold on. That's ugly. All right. That's okay. A DQ. Hold on. Oh, the pencil's not going. Um. I don't know if this point charge business is going to work. Um, Cause it looks like they have, Oh, well that's, that's kind of dumb. I see what they're doing. They're not going to do this. They're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna do something that will drive your math people crazy. Um, let me clear it. <coughs> so they're going to say is that, given again that um, e is equal to um, <coughs> hold on. I thought there was going to be a nicer way to do that. E is equal to minus the integral of, oh, poop, I'm messing up here. That V is equal to minus the integral of E dot DS. All right, so basically what they're saying is, is that <coughs> um, That if you if you take the derivative of both sides, dv is going to be equal to minus e cosine theta ds, and then from there you you already sort of have this, and then you get this one here. I'm trying to figure out why equating these two expressions to the work. Yeah, you could do that, <laughs> uh, but it comes from the math too. So <coughs> there's a few ways to look at it. I guess you can start from work. <coughs> the work energy theorem. But this is already a result of the work energy theorem. So there's no reason to have the cues in there. That's that's just re redundant, repetitive. When you can just use the result from the definition, take the uh, differential and then divide the differential here and you get the... Uh, you get, you know, that naturally gives you this expression. And so you get an idea of how to do this. Now, because you're always taking vectors, and this is very one-dimensional, when you take vector calculus, you'll see that the more correct version for writing this is that, you'll notice it's just the component. You'll notice that really, if you want to get a field, it's going to be equal to the gradient minus the gradient of V. This is the really correct form. Talking in fields in one dimensions is sort of, it's kind of, it's just, just kind of wrong. Uh, we're already admitting that it's a partial derivative here. And, <coughs> and if you're taking vector integrals, you may as well do it. The book shies away from vector derivatives. I'm not sure why, considering they do everything else. <coughs> They're more than happy with vector integration. But, um, but this is it. And if you look at this uh, Nobla symbol here, it, uh, it's, it's not very difficult to, look at. It's just, it will, it will make a scalar into a, a vector. All right. So, so it's kind of cool. Uh, this is all beyond the scope of the book. Um, this is a partial, so, oh, right. This is a partial derivative, but only in that component, right? It's a pure derivative in the full component of S. And to make a vector E, you just take the three-dimensional derivative instead of the one-dimensional derivative. So this is a combination of derivatives.
the Dell. Okay. So from there, <coughs> we're going to look at the potential energy of a system. All right, and we can only do this by looking at it one, uh, one step at a time. So for <coughs> So if you have a two, uh, so the um, if you have a two particle system, right? Then the potential energy between the two particles will be K Q1 Q2 over R. All right. But this is the important point here. I'm sort of surprised they don't do it. The total potential energy for a system of particles is the sum of the potential energies for every two particle system or two every pair of particles in the system. So what that means is that if we want to figure out the uh, potential energy for the triangle below, you'll notice we have one. I'm going to change colors. It's a can, and it's fun. Two. Three pairs. So calculating it is pretty straightforward. But if you're going to do it for the system, you have to remember, you have to calculate the potential energy for the charge distribution. And in order to do that, <coughs> you know, my question to the class is, how many times, how many terms will be in the total potential? So this is for the two-particle system, right? This, this gives you that. Right, good, there will be three. So we'll need U total will equal... Um, <coughs> let's see if we look at it. So, right, so they're all the same distance apart. So we have uh, K over D times Q1, Q2 plus Q1, Q3 plus Q2, Q3. Okay? <laughs> and that's uh, <coughs> that's what we will that's what we will be seeing for that, and that's how you that's how you do it. Uh, the trick is is you have to do the whole system. Okay. All right. So it's getting pretty late. I think we have just one more thing I want to talk about. Um, So that's the, yeah, this idea of a Faraday cage, which is pretty good. Um, if you're in a lightning storm, it's wise to enclose yourself um, <coughs> in a metal shield because you'll notice that the electric field, uh, so, we have, so we have here a plot for both inside and outside the charged spherical shell. So here we have our potential, and then it decreases as we go farther away. But you'll notice the electric field, it's the ability for the, for the charges to move, is zero inside, right? So even though there's a potential difference, there's no field lines pushing the charge. They're just sort of stuck there. And that charge will discharge outside. You can see that on the car here where the, your, the charge is being, uh, the car is certainly being charged from this Tesla coil or whatever, and then discharging into the ground. So... Uh, this is important to read. An excess charge placed on an isolated conductor will distribute itself on the surface of that conductor so that all points of the conductor, whether on the surface or inside, come to the same potential. This is true even if the conductor has an internal cavity and even if that, in, and even if that cavity contains a net charge. All right, so that's what we're basically seeing here. Yes, Douglas? No, there actually isn't. Uh, there's just no electric field. There's no electric field inside the conductor. So there used to be another another thing for this where if they show you a blob, right, a blob with a cavity, and say you're, you're sitting in here, there may be, there may be a potential, there may be a potential difference here, right, you may have that, but inside, inside this cavity, there's no electric field. 
If you do Gauss's law, there's no enclosed charge. The um, electric field is equal to zero. If electric field is zero, you can't have, yes, this is a Faraday cage tree. Very, very good observation. Uh, this is how, this is the Faraday cage, this is how it works. <laughs> okay. So with, um, so with that being said, uh, that is our, our final bit of um, the lecture tonight. That ends this chapter. And that ends the stuff covering test one. So again, test one. Um, I have to see when spring break ends, but if we have a normal spring break, which all indications show that we will, then we will come back on... Remember, you can't follow CUNY spring break. You have to follow LaGuardia's. That's a big thing. Do not... You can follow CUNY's coronavirus schedule, but you can't... Or, and, and things like that, not coronavirus schedule. You can follow its coronavirus info, like about CUNY in general, but LaGuardia has a different schedule, so you want to look at the LaGuardia's webpage. And let me see if I can find it. Um, L-A-G... I know I should be able to type it here. Uh, L-A-G-C-C dot, no, dot key. There we go. Did someone find it already? No, this is... Hold on. And then academic calendar is what I always do. I'm not looking at the chat right now. That's why I haven't seen it. Plus, I, I want to check it anyway. All right. So the official spring break is from the 8th to the 16th. So what I would do is I would have our exam on... Um, let me see. The new exam date is going to be on um, Tuesday the 21st. That will be exam one. <coughs> okay? So write that down in your calendar. <coughs> Hold on. Okay. Wait, what doesn't make sense? The exam or the Faraday cage? The, uh, again, I, uh, uh, there, there's not much I could do. I don't, I feel like with the week we missed, we're not quite ready. I mean, we kind of caught up, but I also need to figure out how to write the exam. So, uh, generally, that's, uh, you know, that could go well, but it might go bad, and I want to be sure that you have an exam that I'm okay with. Because um, <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm not really a fan of, uh, on, of um, multiple choice at all, but it's kind of the best I can do. And we don't have the lockdown browser, so that makes it even worse uh, on my end. <clears throat> so I have to write an exam that I can feel good about. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop recording if there are no more questions, um, so that our movie gets made. <laughs>